Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the Border 100 Symposium, brought to you by myself, Thomas Tormey, historian in residence with Louth County Library Services Decade of Centenaries Programme. Tonight, I'm joined by a very distinguished historian, distinguished historian, Dr. Roisin Healy of NUI Galway. And Roisin is going to talk to us tonight about her research on, Ar on Ireland and Poland, which was published in a book called Poland in the Irish Nationalist Imagination, Anti-Colonialism Within Europe, 1772 to 1922. And is going to focus on comparing partition in Ireland and Poland. So I think this will be of interest to our pe people joining us tonight and of interest to people going forward when we, when we make uh, any recording available, because as is obvious from the 19, sorry, the 20, um, the 2016 census, the um, Polish people were the largest minority within County Louth. So we're particularly pleased to have Roisin with us um, tonight for that reason. And because she's a very distinguished historian of Ireland and Poland. So Roisin. Thanks. Um, thanks, Tommy. Uh, good evening, everybody. And many thanks to, to, to Tommy, Dr. Tommy, for inviting me to take part in the Border 100 programme. Um, I'm very impressed, I have to say, with the, the, the number of dimensions of partition that are being uh, discussed as part of the programme. And I'm delighted to be able to contribute an international aspect to all of this. So if you could just bear with me for a moment, I'm going to bring up some slides. I have lots of maps because it gets rather complicated when you're talking about Poland uh, in this uh, in this era. So if you just give me a second, I'm going to call up those slides. Now, so you should be seeing the slides there. Good. Now, as most of you know, Ireland was divided into two units by the Government of Ireland Act, which was passed by Westminster in November 1920 and became law in May 1921, just 100 years ago. The southern unit consisted of 26 counties and the north of six counties concentrated in the north east. I'm going to have to get used to flicking back and forth here, but you should be able to see a map of, uh, a map of Ireland there on the screen. Good. Um, it was envisaged that these two units would remain within the United Kingdom, but enjoy a large degree of self-government. A majority within the, uh, the South, however, demanded greater independence. After a guerrilla struggle by Irish nationalist paramilitaries against Britain, known as the Anglo-Irish War or War of Independence, the British government entered into talks with the Irish nationalist leadership. The result? was the Anglo-Irish Treaty of December 1921, which granted Ireland dominion status like Canada. As Northern Ireland opted out of this arrangement, the Free State consisted of just the Southern 26 counties. I'm by no means the first historian to compare the partition of Ireland and the experience of partition in other parts of the world. Scholars have compared the partition of Ireland with several others in the 20th century. The most popular points of comparison are India and Palestine. British India was partitioned in 1947 between India and the new state of Pakistan, itself split between modern day Pakistan and Bangladesh. Palestine was effectively partitioned by the creation of the state of Israel in 1948 on the territory of the Palestinian Mandate, a formerly Ottoman or Turkish region placed under British control after World War I. The logic for comparing the partition of Ireland with these is fairly obvious. All of these are the result of decisions by Britain, and indeed the partition of Ireland is often seen as a precedent for partitioning other parts of the British Empire. However, it's important to acknowledge that partition was not unique to the British Empire. Partition happened in other contexts as well, and was by no means limited to colonial territories outside Europe. I want to focus today on another part of Europe that experienced partition. Poland. In comparing Ireland and Poland, we need, however, to start with a consideration of the use of the term partition in the Polish context. Most Poles would argue that the biggest difference between Ireland and Poland is that unlike in Ireland, partition in Poland was not a one-off event. 
In fact, the famous historian Oskar Haletsky, writing in 1945, identified no less than six partitions. And I'm just going to pull them up here because uh, uh, it's hard to, to keep track of them all. Uh, the best known of these are the three partitions of the late 18th century, which took place in 1772, 1793 and 1795. These partitions, engineered by Prussia, Russia and Austria, successively moved the boundaries of the Polish state closer together until the point in 1795 when it disappeared off the map of Europe. The Treaty of Vienna in 1815, which ended the Napoleonic Wars, is often described as a fourth partition. Napoleon had established a semi-autonomous state, the Duchy of Warsaw, in 1807, but in 1815, the victorious powers at Vienna reimposed a border much like that of 1795, dividing the country once again between Russia, Prussia and Austria. Poland remained divided for over a century until 1918, when its next experiment in independence began. The Republic established in 1918 also ended in partition, however, when Germany and the Soviet Union invaded in 1939 and divided the country between them along a preordained line determined by the molotov ribbentrop Pact. The end of World War II brought a further sixth partition as the victorious Soviet Union redrew the borders of Poland, moving the entire country westward by awarding a chunk of Germany to Poland and taking a chunk of Poland for itself. These repeated redefinitions of Poland's borders owed much to the country's geographical position at the heart of Europe. In the case of Poland, partition seems to literally come with the territory. Poland was wedged between strong neighbours, Prussia to the west, Austria to the south and Russia to the east. And its topography, largely flat land, made it difficult to defend. Indeed, besides the Carpathian Mountains south of Krakow, Poland had no obvious natural borders. I'll just show you a, a physical map of uh, Poland here so you get a, a sense of what that's, that's like. You can see the uh, mountainous areas in brown, um, but Poland dominated by, uh, by green as a, as a relatively flat land. Uh, as an island, uh, Ireland was very different. It was blessed with natural borders and its location on the northwestern periphery of Europe meant that it was less vulnerable to invasion from anywhere but the neighbouring island. The natural borders of Ireland also meant that any border on the island appeared to be unnatural. Indeed, the idea of partitioning Ireland came much later than Poland, which had a long experience of changing borders. Partition for Ireland was mooted first in 1912, when Liberal MP Thomas Agar Robarts proposed that the four counties with a Protestant majority, Down, Derry, Armagh and Antrim, be exempted from Home Rule. British Prime Minister Gladstone had embraced the idea of Home Rule or self-government for Ireland in 1886, but only in 1912 was it likely that Home Rule would achieve the necessary majority in the Westminster Parliament to become law. The six partitions of Poland were distinctive, not just in terms of number and timing, but also in their implications. These partitions of Poland involved a loss of sovereignty rather than any concession of autonomy, as was the case in the partition of Ireland. The impetus to the partition of Ireland came from the demand of nationalists for home rule and later independence. The partition of Ireland emerged as a means of exempting the northern part of the island from home rule. By contrast, the partitions of Poland in 1772, 1793 and 1795 constituted annexations of Polish state territory. And this map here shows you, um, shows you the different partitions. So you can see um, there are three different colors here representing each of the neighboring powers. So the uh, largest is, is in pink there, is the portion that Russia obtained. Uh, the piece in the west, the yellow, is the piece that um, Prussia obtained and in the south that which uh, Austria uh, gained. And you can see that um, there are three, uh, three swathes of, of, of territory there in the, in the west and in the east, two in the south. Um, 
and they represent the gains of the uh, of, of the partitions. Austria got land in two of the three partitions, and then Prussia and, us, and Prussia and Russia in all three partitions, and then the country was effectively uh, wiped off the uh, wiped off the map. While Catherine the Great of Russia and Frederick the Great of Prussia made noises about the rights of the Uniate, that's uh, Greek Catholic, uh, Orthodox and Protestant communities, these are generally understood to have been pretexts for more base political motives, territorial expansion. In an Irish context, the closest analogy to these partitions would be the original Norman invasion of the 12th century, which resulted in the control of much of the eastern part of the country by the English king and his lords. And you can see this map of Ireland from, from 1450 shows the green area uh, still under kind of Irish, Irish control, and then the red area around Dublin, known as the Pale, uh, under the control of the English king, and the areas then in blue uh, under the control of the uh, Old English or, or Norman Irish. The second conquest uh, of the 16th century, which completed English control over the Ireland, was, Ireland was similar to the last partition of Poland insofar as it involved the loss of autonomy by the whole island. So if you look at a map of Europe in the 17, in 1700 or so, you'll see that Ireland and, and Britain are, are in the same color because effectively uh, Britain has full control over the, the, the whole island uh, of Ireland at this, at this point. The later partitions of Poland, those of 1815, 1939 and 1945, also involved a loss of autonomy for Poland. As I said, the Treaty of Vienna again sacrificed Poland to foreign powers, although it encouraged these powers to respect the fact that Poland had a history and culture of its own. And you can see the, um, uh, the, the, the 1815 settlement here. So uh, Russia, Prussia and Austria have overtaken, have taken the, 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 the uh, territory of Poland. You'll see a unit there called the Kingdom of Poland. And this was an area in the Russian partition in the Russian part of Poland uh, where certain uh, rights were given to the, uh, the Poles. So they had a greater uh, degree of self-government than uh, elsewhere uh, in Russia, although, although it was also quite uh, quite limited. Um, while Poland's occupation was sanctioned by Western powers, the joint in invasion of 1939 was a grab for territory justified from the German side by a racist ideology that assumed Poles were far inferior to Germans and worthy only to be their slaves. And of course, this is the uh, famous line drawn by the Germans and Soviets in the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939, where they carved up uh, the country between them. So the most uh, dramatic kind of partition, I think. And then the Treaty of Potsdam in 1945, which ended the war, freed Poland from the Germans, but allowed the Soviet Union to exercise control over Poland with no international oversight. So this map um, displays this very nicely because you see the old Poland there in the, uh, the yellow border and then the Poland uh, of today, uh, the area fully in, in brown, having lost uh, lots of territory uh, to, the, to the Soviet Union and having gained territory uh, from uh, Germany there in the north, just under East Prussia there and uh, in, in the west. If attacks on Polish sovereignty were responsible for six redrawings of borders in Poland, it can be argued that the restoration of Polish sovereignty in 1918 also gave rise to what the political scientist Brendan O'Leary has called fresh cuts or new borders that cut across traditional sovereign units. This here is a map of Europe uh, just after World War One, or just a couple of years after World War One, that gives you a sense of how this new state of, uh, of Poland looks. These were the partitions carried out as part of the process of defining the borders of the new Republic of Poland. This wave of partitions was more like the experience in Ireland in the same years, where partition also followed the granting of increased self-government north and south. Irish nationalists who dominated the island apart from the northeast had long campaigned for home rule or autonomy within the United Kingdom or even independence. The British Parliament eventually agreed to this in 1914 although decided to wait until after the war to implement it. The Home Rule Act was to create an all-Irish parliament with the power over domestic policy, 
while leaving control of foreign affairs, war and peace, and most taxation measures to London. The prospect of home rule for Ireland provoked strong objections from the Protestant minority in the North East, who wished to retain the union between Britain and Ireland and were thus known as Unionists. These were largely the descendants of settlers from England and Scotland who had come to Ireland in the 16th and 17th centuries. Ulster had proven particularly resistant to English rule and as a result, the English government had decided to bring or plant a large number of settlers there, all Protestant. Thus, while Protestants were to be found all over Ireland, only in the northeast did they form a majority. This here is a map of the different plantations that took place in the 16th and 17th century. So you see various different colours representing the different uh, time periods uh, when these plantations took place. And the largest one there is in pink in the north, uh, covering most of Ulster. So this represents transfers of populations of, of, of settlers from England and Scotland to, uh, to Ireland with a serious impact on the uh, on, the, on the religious composition of Ireland as the rest of the population uh, generally remained uh, Catholic. Despite uh, the promise of religious freedom in the Home Rule Parliament to be set up in Dublin, Unionists feared the dominance of Roman Catholics within a government based in Dublin and believed that an all-island government would compromise the industrial strength of the North East. This region had a well-developed linen industry and world-famous shipyards, which produced the Titanic, amongst other ships. Unionists were sufficiently exercised to establish, in 1913, a paramilitary organisation, the Ulster Def the Volunteer Force, and to import arms and conduct military training to protect the North East from the imposition of home rule. This is a map that shows the, the religious demography uh, of Ireland uh, shortly before World War One. And what you see there is that uh, the areas that are in the palest green are the areas with uh, the fewest number of Catholics. So uh, the largest number of Protestants. And you can see there there's, a, there's an obvious pattern dating back to that, uh, th those plantations where there's a, a predominantly um, Catholic population, much of the country apart from, from the north, uh, from the northeast. Uh, the Ulster Volunteer Force, which was founded in 1913, is pictured here on the left, uh, marching, um, and in the in, 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 in the, the the right, um, the uh, response came from the south. So nationalists who were overwhelmingly Catholic responded by creating their own paramilitary organisation, the Irish Volunteers, later in 1913. A minority of nationalists went so far as to demand full independence and launched a rebellion to this end in the midst of World War One. In Easter 1916. While the Rising failed, its brutal suppression by British forces radicalised Irish opinion and encouraged a majority to vote for Sinn Féin in 1918, a party that took up the demands of the 1916 rebels. If the prospect of home rule caused deep division in Ireland, the prospect of independence for Poland was even more problematic because it contained more than two main ethnic and religious communities. While under foreign occupation from 19, 1795 to 1918, Polish nationalists had mostly imagined a restored Polish state within the borders of the old Commonwealth or state of Poland, Lithuania. Yet this Commonwealth had at its height spanned parts of present day Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Russia, Belarus and Ukraine, and thus counted millions of non-Poles among its subjects. And this is a map that shows you, uh, giving today's countries the extent of the old Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, so the state that existed up until uh, 1795. So you can see it's really uh, extensive and there are lots of different um, ethnic groups there. There were Germans in the West, Balts in the North and Northeast, and various Slavic groups in the East, along with Jews who were scattered across the whole territory. As well as Jews and a small number of Muslims, the Commonwealth also contained several Christian denominations. While the Poles were mainly Roman Catholic, the German population was largely Lutheran, and some of the Eastern Slavs were Greek Catholics or Uniates who followed Orthodox rites but accepted the authority of the Pope. So kind of halfway between Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. While these different groups tended to be concentrated in certain regions, in both Ireland and Poland, there was a high degree of intermixing as a result of the particular pattern of settlement. In Ireland, while Protestants were concentrated in the Northeast, they often lived in villages or towns that had sizable Catholic populations. 
In Poland, the medieval Drang nach Osten, the eastward movement of Germans into Slavic areas, had created German enclaves among otherwise Slavic populations. And this map gives you a, a good sense of, of what it was like. So this is a map of Central Europe in 1910, and the dark blue areas represent Germans, uh, ethnic Germans. So not surprisingly, the bulk of uh, Germany is filled with uh, Germans, but you'll also, and you'll see some down in Austria, of course, too, but you'll see um, uh, little uh, flecks um, all across the uh, modern day uh, Poland, which represent a uh, German community. So they extended uh, way beyond uh, the areas that were um, historically part of the, the German state. As in Ireland, there was a strong correlation between religion and ethnic affiliation, as I said, with most Poles being Catholic, most Germans Protestant. Each community also had a distinct socioeconomic profile. In both Ireland and Western Poland, Protestants were more likely to live in towns and were, on average, more prosperous than Catholics. In other words, the German community in Western Poland were similar to the Anglo-Irish in Ireland. Further east, where other Slavic peoples formed a majority in the countryside, what we would now call the other Russians or Ukrainians, the Poles enjoyed a privileged position like the Anglo-Irish in Ireland. And the Markievicz couple exemplifies the parallels between the two communities. Constance Markievicz was a member of the Protestant Anglo-Irish Gore Booth family of Lizadell in County Sligo, which owned an estate that was largely rented out to Catholics who saw themselves as Irish. Her husband, uh, Kazimir Markievicz, was an ethnic Pole whose family owned an estate rented out to Ukrainians, generally of Greek Catholic faith. Jews often found themselves caught in the middle. They typically spoke Yiddish, a medieval German language with lots of Hebrew words at home, and whatever language they needed outside the home, be it German, Polish, Ukrainian, uh, Lithuanian, and so forth. Few embraced the drive for a Jewish state or Zionism. If you were to ask the Jews in Western Poland, the apocryphal question asked of Jews in Northern Ireland, what are you, a Catholic or a Protestant Jew? They would most likely have answered a Protestant Jew or a German Jew. Jews felt relatively well treated in Prussia and Germany, at least until World War I, and many Jews in, the, uh, many Jews in, 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 in this area feared that they had more to lose from a Polish state. Like the Poles, by the early 20th century, the Ukrainians and many other ethnic groups in Central Europe had developed nationalist aspirations of their own. This made the emergence of a Polish state in 1918 hugely problematic. Poland benefited from the support of the Entente powers in its campaign for nationhood and was declared a republic on the 11th of November 1918. Once re-established, the Polish state displayed little sympathy for the territorial claims of others, whether they were based on ethnic or historical considerations. For example, immediately after independence, the new state supported Poles in the province of Poznania, which sought to liberate the province from Germany. Two thirds of Poznania's population was Polish, and these wished to be part of the new Polish state, and did not want to wait the decision of the post-war peace conference. Yet one third of the population was German, many belonging to families who had lived there for centuries. The Poles managed to oust the Germans from all but 10% of Poznania. Presented with the fait accompli, the Paris Peace Conference confirmed the partition of Poznania. And you can see here the Germans in, in, in the Weimar period had a, a territory known as Grenzmark, Poles and Westkreisen, and this uh, was made up of areas that had been in the uh, province of, of Poznania, um, but had uh, had not been transferred to, to Poland, whereas the area around the state, the city of, of Posen there, um, was awarded to the, uh, the Polish state. In the east, Poland fought and won a war against Ukraine, which confirmed the division of Ukraine into western and eastern regions. In July 1919, Poland gained control over the western part around Lviv, or Lviv as the Ukrainians would call it, while the rest remained under Russian control as the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. To the north, Polish troops split another historic territory, the Duchy of Lithuania. 
it had joined with the Kingdom of Poland in 1569 to form the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, but sought and gained independence after World War I. It had to sacrifice its historic capital, Vilnius, however, as the Polish state captured it, using the justification that the city had an ethnic Polish majority. Indeed, Poland pushed its eastern border 200 kilometers beyond what had been agreed by the Entente and known as the Curzon Line. To return to this map of, of Europe in 1922, you can see how far east the border goes and you'll see um, Vilnius or, or, or Vilno um, there in blue, in, in the blue territory that belonged to, uh, to interwar Poland rather than uh, Lithuania as um, today. It should be pointed out that Poland was not unusual in putting its own national aspirations before those of others. In January 1919, the new state of Czechoslovakia took advantage of Poland's military campaigns in the east to seize part of Poland, namely part of Silesia, where Czech was spoken. The international community was also involved in partitioning historic units. It recognized borders established by military victories, even when they divided national territories such as Lithuania or Ukraine or provinces like Poznania. It was also directly responsible for the division of another historic province, West Prussia or Royal Prussia. In promising Poland access to the sea in his 14 point speech, Woodrow Wilson effectively proposed partition. The Paris Peace Conference implemented his proposal, separating Danzig or Gdansk, the capital of West Prussia, from its hinterland. While the Germans, who made up the vast majority of the, citizen, of the city of Danzig, enjoyed the status of a free city under the League of Nations with the protection of a high commissioner, many other Germans ended up under Polish rule. The part of West Prussia ceded to Poland had a, a majority or had a large German minority of about 42 um, percent and this is the area that i'm talking about here the famous polish corridor and you can see danzig there or um, modern day gdansk has a separate status as a free city under the league of nations uh, enjoying a high commissioner including uh, a belfast uh, protestant turned uh, nationalist sean lester in the, in the 1930s and then the area uh, to the west there is the polish corridor which as i said in fact had a large uh, proportion of uh, of germans Wilson and the Allies were able to push through the settlement because Germany had lost the war. As a defeated power with a severely weakened army, Germany was powerless to stop the Poles seizing the province of Poznania and the Allies awarding much of West Prussia to the new Polish Republic. The result of the war had very different implications for Ireland. By winning the war, Britain freed itself from any obligation to answer to other powers for what it did in Ireland. Granted, there was some external pressure on Britain, as historian Morris Walsh has shown, international revulsion against British atrocities in Ireland during the War of Independence pushed Britain towards reaching a settlement with Irish nationalists. Britain valued its international reputation. The rhetoric of the rights of small nations, bolstered by Wilson's arguments in favour of self-determination, also played a role. Ultimately, however, Britain had much autonomy in making decisions about the future political arrangements of Ireland. That is not to say that the British government was enthusiastic about partition. It was unionists in Ulster who pushed for partition in preference to being subjected to rule from Dublin. They helped to persuade Berlin or Britain that this would be the most viable long-term solution for Ireland. They also made the most of their ideological and personal links with the British government to define the border in a way most favorable to their interests. Unionists marshaled economic arguments to maximize the territory of the polity in the north. They claimed that they would need six counties to make it economically viable. This would include two counties, Fermanagh and Tyrone, where Protestants made up only 44% of the population. This here is a map that shows um, uh, non-Catholics, so uh, as part of the population uh, of, the, uh, of, of what became Northern Ireland. And you can see that the areas in the, in the east um, places like um, Antrim and um, uh, Antrim and, and Down um, are very heavily uh, Protestant um, in red, but places like Fermanagh and Tyrone have more green or white, which which indicates a sort of a, a, a mid uh, a half of a split, but equally between Protestants and um, and Catholics. Unionist leaders also maintained that a Dublin government would tax industry in the north to the point that it would collapse. 
Interestingly, Wilson's argument for the partition of West Prussia was also an economic one. He said that the new Polish state needed access to the sea to be economically viable. The Poles resented the loss of the leading Baltic port of Danzig, but made the most of the situation by building a large port just to its west in Gdynia on Polish territory. Wilson showed little regard for the German population caught in the new Polish corridor. Then neither did the Unionists display much sympathy for Protestants who ended up in the new free state. The Unionists gave up their claim on three Ulster counties with sizable Protestant populations, Donegal, Cavan and Monaghan, which you can see just outside the, the border here, because their inclusion would have resulted in a Catholic rather than a Protestant majority in the new entity and thus jeopardised Unionist political domination. Ultimately, the British government divided the island into two units of six and 26 counties in the Government of Ireland Act of 1920. The Northern unit exercised its right to secede from the Home Rule arrangements and thus did not join the Free State established by the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. About a third of the new Northern Irish state were Catholics. Unlike the new Polish Republic, the Free State made no attempt to expand beyond the, 30, the 26 counties it had been granted. The proposals to partition other mixed German and Polish provinces offer closer parallels to the partition of Ireland insofar as they involved a conscious effort to address intercommunal conflict. Two areas were disputed, one in the north of Poland and one in the southwest. East Prussia, with its capital at Königsberg, was predominantly German. It had been in possession of the Teutonic Knights, but had a small Polish majority in the south, which spilled over into the neighbouring province of West Prussia. Similarly, Silesia was largely German, but had a Polish minority in the south, in Upper Silesia. Drawing a border that ensured that as few people as possible got caught on the wrong side posed a similar challenge in Poland as in Ireland. Yet unlike in Ireland, a decision was made to hold plebiscites to identify where exactly the provinces might be split and which parts should remain with Germany and which parts should be awarded to the new Polish Republic. Moreover, the decision was made not by the existing power, Germany, but by an international organization, the Inter-Allied Commission established by the Paris Peace Conference. The German government was reduced to lobbying the local population to vote for Germany. Sinn Féin leader Arthur Griffith had proposed a plebiscite for the North, but was persuaded that a boundary commission would make any changes necessary to reflect the anomalies in the pattern of nationalists and unionists along the border. Yet while conceived as a means of enhancing the legitimacy of the border, the plebiscites in Poland proved far from the easy resolution often imagined in the Irish case. Once the intention to hold a plebiscite was made known, they became a focus of intense lobbying on both sides. Violence and intimidation were the order of the day, and Allied troops from France, Italy and Britain were required on the ground to keep the peace. The British commissioner, Henry Beaumont, believed that their presence exacerbated the racial antagonism he identified there. Interestingly, some Irish troops were involved in keeping the peace. The Royal Irish Regiment was stationed in the Allenstein or Austin region of East Prussia for six months in 1920 and in Upper Silesia the following year. The lines of division might well have reminded soldiers of the Anglo-Irish war raging at home. An officer present explained the Silesian conflict to Henry, Sir Henry Wilson, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, and originally from Longford, by identifying the Poles as Sinn Féin, the German self-defence units as the Ulster Volunteer Force, and the Allied forces of the British Army. The historian Tim Wilson has shown, however, that the level of communal violence in Upper Silesia far exceeded that in Ireland in the same period and the plebiscite contributed to the surge. Fatalities in Upper Silesia between 1918 and 1922 were about three times higher per capita than, than in Ulster, and violence was also more vicious in, than in Ireland, involving the rape of women, the torture of prisoners, the mutilation of corpses, and the denial of a decent burial. He ascribes the difference to the fact that the ethnic divisions in Upper Silesia were based on language rather than religion, and usually in this region, both the Germans and Poles were overwhelmingly Catholic. Identity in Upper Silesia was thus more fluid and could be shifted with the exercise of extreme force. The results offer a useful counterpoint to claims that a plebiscite might have resulted in significant changes to the Irish border. Not all voters voted in accordance with their presumed identities. 
In both plebiscites, a considerable number of, number of Polish speakers opted to stay in Germany rather than join the new Polish state. In the Allenstein area of East Prussia, which voted on the 11th of July 1920, an overwhelming majority, 93%, voted to stay with Germany. The Polish vote uh, for Germany was less pronounced, um, but still significant nine months later in March 1921, when the plebiscite took place in Upper Silesia. In a province in which about 60% spoke Polish, 60% voted in favor of German rule, as opposed to 40% for Polish rule, meaning that about a third of Polish speakers opted for Germany. Economic motives played a role. Awkwardly mobile voters were drawn to Germany as the land of opportunity. The decision of many Irish people to embrace the English language for economic reasons and decades before suggests that some nationalist voters in Ireland might well have been swayed by economic motives and voted to stay within the UK. Political conservatism may also have put off some voters off Poland. After 123 years of partition, independent statehood was something of an experiment in Poland. Indeed, in July 1920, as voters in East Prussia and West Prussia just over the border went to the polls, it was not at all clear that it would succeed. The Soviet army was advancing on the Polish capital, Warsaw, and one of the many wars over Poland's borders. Some nationalists in the North may have been similarly wary of the free state's ability to manage its security or indeed domestic affairs. Finally, while Poland ultimately weathered the Soviet attack, those voting in Upper Silesia the following March might have made a distinction between the old imperial German state with its aggressive anti-Polish policies and the new Weimar Republic. Indeed, the new Republic was officially secular, recognizing no established faith, and thus there was little danger of a renewal of the Kulturkampf or attack on Catholics that had divided Germany in the 1870s. Unlike in Poland, religious arguments were thus not to the fore in Poland. If voters in Ireland were placed with a, faced with a plebiscite, nationalists might not have made the same distinction between old and new. There was little indication that Northern Ireland would be more conciliatory on matters of importance to nationalists. And indeed, there was much in the unionist rhetoric of the revolutionary period to alarm them. Nor did the lack of international oversight provide any comfort. Irish nationalists could appeal only as far as Britain, and for the most part, um, uh, and for the most part, the the, uh, the Polish example shows that international oversight was in fact not always impartial. France was alarmed at the prospect that so much of Upper Silesia would remain with Germany, and appealed to the League of Nations to review the result. France was determined to create a strong Poland that would keep Germany in check. Another international panel redrew the border giving only three quarters of the area and just half the population to Germany, while ceding the industrial heartland to Poland. So the areas in, uh, in pink uh, went to Germany and the areas in, uh, in yellow and, and green went to, uh, went to Poland. Um, and the area that, that, that Poland uh, gained contained a large German majority nearly 30% of the population. Despite the plebiscites and international intervention, partition was by no means satisfactory to all. It left many people on the wrong side of the border, and interwar Poland contained a large number of uh, non-Poles, as this map shows. So this uh, represents the, the Poles here in pink, but you can see lots of other nationalities there, the Germans in brown towards the, the, the west, and then various other Slavic groups, um, the Czechs, Belarusians, Ruthenians, what we would call Ukrainians, as well as the, the, the Lithuanian Balts there in the, uh, in the north. Um, and there were large uh, German majorities, or uh, large German minorities in places like West Prussia and uh, Poznania. In fact, um, wary of the ethnic hierarchy espoused by some Polish leaders, the Allies insisted that the, Pol the Poles accept a minorities protection treaty, which guaranteed minorities the same civil and political rights enjoyed by Poles, religious freedom and state funded schooling in their own languages. The German minority claimed plenty of violations and the League of Nations generally upheld their, uh, their claims. And many of those 
chose to leave for Germany nonetheless, rather than endure Polish government. As many as half of the German community may have left West Prussia and Poznani in the years immediately after uh, the war and the creation of the Polish state. Just 34% of Protestants living in Southern Ireland abandoned it um, in the years to 1926. Although the War of Independence had featured lots of attacks on big houses belonging to the Anglo-Irish, the new state refrained from explicitly uh, anti-Protestant measures. The nationalist minority in Northern Ireland might have benefited from such protection, however, as the regime in which they lived subjected them to considerable discrimination. Nationalists had expected that the Boundary Commission would rescue many from such a fate by redrawing the border, but it proved a disappointed appointment recommending very minor changes which were uh, rejected by both sides. So to conclude, just a few observations on uh, the uh, parallels between or the, 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 the comparison between Poland and Ireland. So what does the, the, the Polish experience of partition tell us about the partition of Ireland? First, it reminds us that the redrawing of borders was far from unusual in Europe. The rise of nation states necessitated new borders, which in the very complex demographic context of Ireland and Central and Eastern Europe, virtually inevitably led to the partition of historic units and the sacrifice of some people to a government not of their own choice. The presence of a sea border between Ireland and Britain was no guarantee of territorial integrity. Second, it shows us the difficulty of taking local voices into account. Plebiscites bring their own problems. In forcing people into binary and permanent choices, they heighten the stakes and thus may encourage violence. Indeed, plebiscites also crowd out more imaginative solutions such as shared sovereignty or regional autonomy. A small group within Silesia, for instance, had hoped for a third way, a high degree of self-government within Germany or even full independence for Upper Silesia but the power of German and Polish nationalist forces did not allow it. Third, it suggests that international oversight may be helpful. Of course, outside powers bring, up their, bring their own interests and insecurities, but the right of appeal to a third party did allow some real concerns of the German minority in interwar Poland to be addressed. The promise of such protections might have dampened down the fiery rhetoric and violence that accompanied the partition of Ireland in 1920. Yet the fact remains that despite partition, Ireland remained far more stable than Central Europe in these decades when the Nazis used the ethnic German minority of Poland as a pretext to launch a war that once again destroyed the Polish state. This shows that partition is not fixed in stone, but subject to political and ideological changes of regime. The Irish border is more likely to change or be removed within the context of a democratic decision by the people of this island based on referenda north and south. While Poland had only limited and temporary border changes as a result of referenda, the Polish experience of partition in the 19th century reminds us that border changes are often difficult. Even people belonging to the same ethnic group and with the same commitment to unity may need time to knit together after the experience of separate regimes. Traces of former rulers can be seen in the vocabulary used in different parts of Poland, influenced by the respective rulers or variations in cuisine. And the Poles who live in the formerly Prussian territory still suffer from the reputation of being politically acquiescent, not having led any major rebellion, whereas those in the formerly Russian partition enjoy a more fiery reputation. The unification of Ireland, if it is to come, will pose major challenges not just for unionists, but also for nationalists. Thanks very much. I'm just going to stop sharing here. Yeah. Thanks very much, Roshan. I suppose one, one, there's a lot, it's such a broad topic that it, it's hard to um, pick little specifics to ask about, but um, I'm just gonna, I, while we're, if we get any questions from the audience, that'd be great, and I'll um, put them put them through. Um, in the moment, I'll I'll abuse my position and ask a couple of questions. I couldn't help but notice that in two of the maps you put up, and you put up the map of the Boundary Commission um, proposed changes there, uh, just the last second. But prior to that, you had I think it was a map by was it Poor Law Unions of um, percentage of Catholics. Uh, within the um, either the rural districts or poor law unions or one of those um, subdivisions of counties. 
uh, that showed percentage of Catholics. And it was quite interesting to note that the the poor law union map didn't quite match the um, the boundary commission's map. I don't know if you have any thoughts on where the differences were. Um, I'd have to remind myself now of uh, of the different maps here. Let me just see now the one you're referring to. Uh, are you referring to the one with the, the green and red? Is it? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I would push. I, I mean, have to I say, it's, it's, maybe, it's maybe it's because of the the way the well, obviously I, I hesitate to suggest that the boundary commission was an honest reflection of of the demographics on the ground, but it's just interesting to note that. Particularly the, the border, what we might call the western border of Armagh, where Armagh meets Monaghan there just after the border turns around across the Glen. It's interesting mm -hmm. that there seemed to be a bit of a contrast there because there seemed to be um, quite uh, heavy enough. It didn't say there seemed to be a Catholic majority up there, but that was actually one area where the Boundary Commission suggested should, should move. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or if it's just getting too nitty gritty. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that map that I have is actually a bit unsatisfactory in that it it, it has a broad band for kind of the middle uh, area between 40 and 60 percent, which is sort of the, the it's a critical difference, you know, 40 or 60. I mean, 49 or, 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 or 51 makes a big difference there. So um, I'm uh, to be honest, I, I, I don't think I could couldn't give you any further further comment on the intricacies of that. Um, uh, I, I suspect that you have other speakers who are talking. You have another speaker talking about the Boundary Commission, is that right? We have a, we have a panel. We had we had a panel on the um, Boundary Commission last week. So, and they um, they didn't we, address we, we, that. We, never actually, we, we got more. We were more talking about the, the Boundary Commission around Newry and and then more generally. So yeah, but yeah, no, it's just an interesting one. I think it may be as well that the Boundary Commission kind of dug even below the poor law union, so so that the. The way the shading works probably doesn't make maybe maybe they could argue that it reflects um things on the ground i did notice actually though that the the area that on the last map that was um shown where they where the boundary commission suggested moving a part of county monon into the north i did notice that when somebody produced a copy of the tallies for the last election online uh, for Monaghan, that the area that was shaded that should have moved to the north was shaded very heavily for Fine Gael. So uh, we can make of that what we will. Um, I think I think one one thing that was really interesting in your your paper, which is the parallel between Germans um, and their tendency to to live in urban areas, and the same tendency for Protestants, um, English like people speaking English all sorts of indicators that we might use of connections to Britain to be concentrated in urban areas and even even in rural areas within the towns in the, the small towns in the rural areas I mean what's the origin of that is that was there similar plantations or or what was the origin of that in Eastern Europe yeah the as I said the Germans kind of advance over into this area in the medieval period and then other groups of settlers come subsequently now some of them actually become Polonized, as they say, some of them kind of go native and they disappear from the map then, and others retain their identity. I think what happens in, in Poland, in the German part of Poland, is that they are replenished in the period when Germany takes control. So some parts of Poland are under German control from 1772, so that area around Poznania, um, uh, for instance, and uh, they are privileged by the regime. So they get all the good jobs. Um, in terms of, uh, and I suppose we associate uh, the cities with, with you know, office jobs, sort of more the professions. Germans are advantaged in that the universities, the, the education is exclusively through through German, and there are some differences between the different partitions. For instance, the Austrians allow education through Polish, so the uh, the university in Krakow um, and in, in, in Lemberg or Lviv actually allows education through Polish. So you do get more of a native elite there, you know, a more mm -hmm. urban kind of profile for the for the Poles there, but not in the uh, in the German part. So effectively, the Germans are, are are privileged by the regime and that allows them to have, um, you know, a more a, a, a higher socioeconomic profile vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 the Poles. Uh, yeah, and possibly an interesting um, 
comment on how successful the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was for such a long time in keeping ethnicities happy. Yeah, yes and no, I'm going to have to say there, because one of the peculiarities of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was that around uh, the same time as unification, around 1867, 1868, the Austrians actually devolved power to the Poles in Galicia, so the area around Krakow and, and, and Lviv, and they effectively allow the Poles to dominate the Ukrainians. So basically the western half is heavily Polish, the eastern half is heavily uh, Ukrainian, with the exception of the, 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 the towns in Lviv, um, or Lviv is heavily Polish. and. The Poles, you know, do what they want. So the Poles really are not interested in allowing Ukrainian language schools, or uh, they 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 more or less fix the election so that they always dominate. So uh, sometimes you use it that the term sort of nesting colonialisms. There are sort of whole layers of <laughs> injustice here, and the Poles are both sort of the the, the, the the oppressor and the oppressed. So that that's important, I think, to, to acknowledge. I, I always have a uh, sort of a soft spot for the Ukrainians because I feel that they lose out so many times, and I think it's it's worth it's worth pointing that out. It's interesting. Yeah, I think Lloyd George also had a soft spot for the Ukrainians, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. He was pretty, uh, he's pretty harsh on 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 the polls, and uh, the polls did, did uh, uh, you know, they did plenty of things that were very controversial and that really provoked the the allies. So I think that that made it that made it difficult for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the reflections in the, the reflections you were talking about about the British officers there. I mean, that's one thing that's also interesting if you look at. Um, as I have, sadly, uh, the papers of British officers who are in Ireland in 1920 and 21 is that actually frequently they're in um, correspondence with their friends who are stationed in in Poland and and uh, Germany at the time. So it's interesting to see those comparisons did are occurring to them. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I think when you look at a, things from a biographical perspective, you often you often become more aware of those kind of links uh, because these these individuals are going to different places and observing things. Uh, I was intrigued when I discovered that Irish people were were present in the British Army. And why wouldn't they be? Um, you know, they they formed such a part of it, but that they were uh, operating there in Poland in in a fairly analogous situation. And it, it's very hard to know what they thought. I mean, obviously, some of these. Irish were, were Anglo-Irish. One of them was uh, Jack Murrah, who had uh, taken down the the tricolour off the GPO and was was run out of run out of Cork as a result. Um, and yet others, the rank and file, even even at this point, even uh, you know during the War of Independence, some of them would have had nationalist sympathies. So one, one wonders um, what they would have thought, or, or even. You know, to what extent they they grasped the the complexity of the situation yeah it's, yeah, it's interesting because uh, as i just said it's just it's something that did occur to me before just reading the, the amount there's a large um large amount of correspondence from the two the two commanders for munster and, and Connaught anyway that i've, that I've read uh, i have a question here that I, i've taken out of the ask a question section which is from um patrick mahan who firstly wanted to say congratulations on a very articulate and fluid presentation um which is very fair comment, Patrick. He also asks, would you be able to place your two subject areas on a spectrum of complexity? What are the lessons you hinted? What are the lessons you hinted at the differences brought by the passages of time? Are there others? In terms of complexity, I think the polls win hands down, <laughs> um, just because of the the huge number of different ethnic and religious groups, and the fact that there are lots of groups that will be considered sort of in between groups. Um, these are maybe like the Silesians, but there are also groups like Kashubians, Missourians, that don't fall easily into any category. I mean, I find the Missourians really fascinating because these are Polish-speaking Protestants. So this isn't what one expects, right? Um, we always think, oh, Poles are all Catholic. But in fact, there is a community of Polish-speaking Protestants up in East Prussia, in, the, in the, the southern part of East Prussia, because that area has been part of the Teutonic Knights territory for years. So they changed during the Reformation. And they there's a big struggle 
over them because both the Poles and the Germans want to win them over. And if they go by religion, they're going to go the German route. If they go by language, they're going to go the Polish route. So there's a lot to be to be played for there. And in the end, they actually go with the with the Germans. I mean, as you saw, the 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 the, the result of the plebiscite is overwhelmingly in favor of uh, in favor of of Germany, and they uh, they they throw in their lot with them. Um, and it reminds us as well that religion is still actually quite important in this period. Um, religious identity for for for, for these people. Um, and in terms of uh, uh, lessons. I suppose that the, the big lesson that I would draw out of it is that we tend to think Irish Ireland is exceptional, right? We we tend to look at it uh, as sort of sui generis, very different from elsewhere, but that in fact Ireland is very typical of much of Europe. It's just that when we look at Europe, we tend only to look at Western Europe, and we look at states that are very centralised, like Britain and France, um, states that are ethnically uh, homogenous like uh, maybe Germany for, 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 for some of its history at least. But the reality for half of Europe really is that there's a huge mixture of different uh, ethnic groups and religious groups. Um, so I think Ireland is, is much more like Eastern Europe in, in that respect. But we have suffered much less than Eastern Europe, <laughs> I think certainly in, in the, the, the 20th century because of our geographic position, because we didn't get embroiled in, in a war. Now, one, one could argue that Ireland experienced a lot of what Central Europeans experienced. Uh, Ireland experienced that in the 16th and 17th centuries, what a lot of these Central Europeans experienced much later in the 19th and 20th centuries. So if you look at German rule in, in Poland, it's relatively benign. Um, up until the late 19th century, and of course, especially under under the Nazis, right? Um, but if you look at English rule in Ireland, they're doing some pretty nasty things in the 17th century. So that by the 19th century, one could argue they don't need to <laughs> to do much more. They've already kind of conquered the country. Their language is is dominant. There's a quite a high level of acceptance for the political regime throughout much of the 19th century, things change a little bit with the cultural revival. Um, uh, but the things are, are are calmer in Ireland as a result of that earlier traumatic experience. Yeah, OK, thanks. Um, I mean, just there's another question in the chat here, which I'll get to in a sec, but I just wanted to ask you about the plebiscites, because I think one, one interesting thing about Ireland when you look at it is that a lot of people um although there may be a lot of people don't i mean maybe it's a bit like brexit it's a lot of people don't think that there will be an economic cost to independence so they have things like the children's report on taxation which said ireland had been overtaxed for the 19th century etc um so wh what was the how conscious were you know when you say the pe polish pe people who were expected to vote um as poles ended up voting as germans you know, simplify things um w were they aware of the economics were there any studies of that what i mean were they very clear that these were e economic reasons they were doing this as well in yeah you know, i know i know you kind of drew a distinction there just between pure economic reasons and political conservatism but were, how aware were they of the, the the role their position within the german empire played in their prosperity so yeah, I, I think they were quite cute about the whole thing. I think some of them were quite instrumental. Uh, reminds me a little bit about how my, my father used to vote on the basis of, you know, the budget and who is going to tax them more. He wouldn't vote for them. Um, so that's, you know, how a lot of them operated. They were, you know, they were they were not ignorant peasants. You know, they were they were canny political operators. We have to remember that there was universal suffrage, male suffrage in Germany from 1871. All these polls could vote. They had been voting since 1871. They knew how to work the system. So I think they looked at these things uh, very carefully. Um, the Polish nationalist movement is, is very aware of economics because I, I, I should have mentioned that this area of Upper Silesia is the second greatest industrial area within Germany. So there's loads of coal reserves um, and it's, it's really important that they get hold of that. So I think at a, at a personal level and also at a, a level of the leadership, 
they are very very conscious of economic uh, of economic factors. Okay, interesting. Um, John Dorn has asked, "What are the what are your thoughts on the par on parallels historians have made between German paramilitaries such as the Freikorps who fought against Polish nationalists and the Black and Tans auxiliaries sent to Ireland?" Yeah, I, I think those parallels are are, are quite uh, legitimate. I mean, certainly in terms of the the methods that are used, they're they're pretty cruel and uh, motivated in part, I think, by you know ethnic sectarian considerations. I mean, one thing just to note is that that there are also people on the ground, people who have been there for centuries, these Germans, who are also taking part in fighting against Polish nationalists. So it's not simply people who are sort of coming in from the outside, but it's also local. So you have those two kind of working uh, together, I suppose, in a sense, um, uh, that you would have in, in certain um, in certain parts of, 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 uh, of the North as well. Yeah, um, yeah, possibly, possibly the two, possibly referring there to the two great unmentionables about the the um, British campaign in Ireland is that the, the number of Irish-born people recruited to the Black and Tans, possibly similar to the, the Germans you're talking about, and as well the role we probably um, it's probably people understate the role of the old Irish RIC in in some of the atrocities as well. So they maybe have parallels with the, the people you're talking about. Yeah, I suppose I was thinking of that. You know, you tend to think of the Poles as 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 as, as being uh, like the 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 Irish and the Germans being more like the, the the British. There aren't that many Poles, I think, who are brave enough to collaborate with the with the Germans at at this point. Nor nor do they need to because Germany is a defeated power. Um, the whole question of I suppose. Uh, collaboration is, is is a thorny one and I kind of touched on it at the end that the whole notion of sort of West Brits or, or Castle Catholics um that term isn't used in, in Poland I can't think of it an analogous term but there is certainly a phenomenon of some people you know going along with the the German regime more than others and the ones in 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 Prussia and the German part are seen as, as, as being more acquiescent and sort of have a, have a bad reputation as a result of that. They don't live up to the to the image of the, the revolutionary pole. But, you know, people couldn't be revolting all the time. You know, people <laughs> also had to live their, their everyday lives. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, John makes the point that, that perhaps the Ulster specials are a good comparison. I think I think you mentioned that in the last line, what you were saying there a minute ago about the different more kind of parallels with the, the North. Um, just one question maybe about Poland um or, or the the area that's now Poland during the Second World War because you you alluded to it during the, the talk is there much evidence of um you know atrocities in Germany I mean I think there are we think there are evidence that Germans who were from outside the borders of Germany as it was defined in the 1920s were more militant Nazis maybe than than Germans who were from within those borders but was there much evidence of of Poles who were, or sorry, Germans who were involved in um, fighting in the period we were kind of concentrating on to a degree in the post First World War period, coming back, um, and are people who left in the nineteen twenties coming back as part of the forces of the Third Reich and, and being involved in atrocities? Or was, have you ever seen that referred to? Or? Um. Yeah. I mean, obviously, some of these uh, Germans moved to Germany proper after the after the polish state has been established they don't want to, to live under the poles they they sort of think the poles are incompetent and and hostile to them so they leave they don't all go to to, to they don't all go west some of them in fact go to uh, danzig which is is a free state um and one i can think of as arthur Geiser, um who's one of these who goes to, to goes to danzig and he ends up being a pretty nasty character in the uh, in the third reich um goes back to the region and is a, a Gauleiter and you know carries out pretty nasty policies against the Poles and and Jews. So he's you know one of the the, the worst products of the regime. So certainly uh, I would say that there are individuals from the area who feel particularly aggrieved 
about the post-war settlement, about the loss of territory, and are motivated by that um, to go towards Nazism. Although, you know, there there are lots of career reasons for people to embrace Nazism too, and, and Gweiser was that was as much a, a factor for Gweiser as for as as the as the ideological component. Is is his son quite well known now? Is am I thinking of the right guy? I don't know anything about the son. And son, I think there's a son. Like his son is, makes TV programs and stuff about going back to Poland. I think. I think there, are, there's a whole kind of series of them who are uh, trying to sort of come to terms with their their father's past. There's an Otto Vechta and Philip uh, Philip Sands, the journalist and, and lawyer, international lawyer. He has has written a lot on 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 this about people trying to come to terms with what their ancestors did, and and the attitudes vary a lot. I mean, some people. Uh, are very critical of their ancestors, and some people try to make excuses for them. That's interesting. Uh, a question: I mean, how how much um, knowledge would there be within Poland, both in terms of public history, maybe, and academics, about, say, the parallels that you drew with you parallels you're drawing in your 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 um, talk. I think there's probably very little about the process of partition, um, but I think there's a lot more about the 19th century, about the, what the Poles call the period of the partition. So that's the, the period from 1795 to 1918. Uh, and during that period too, a lot of Polish nationalists mm -hmm. are talking about parallels between Ireland and Poland. Some of them look to Ireland for inspiration and particularly the cultural revival. So you see a, a kind of a theater revival in Poland that echoes very much what happens with uh, with Yeats, you know, the idea of like, creating a national theater. And, and in fact, uh, Kazimir Markiewicz is involved in, in this too, in, in both places actually. So there is a strong consciousness of it, but what I find in, in uh, in sort of in, in, in Polish popular understanding of history, the 20th century dominates so much because it was so devastating and it was relatively recent. So that tends to sort of crowd out World War One uh, largely and that immediate post-war period. Whereas for us, I think it's it's the it's the founding era, right? I mean, it's the decade of centenaries is what we're looking at, and it it's very meaningful for people. Um, uh, because of the continuous state, I suppose, north and north and south. But for for Poles, there's so much discontinuity, there's so much rupture that this immediate post-war period is sort of lost. And certainly the parallels with Ireland, I think, are are, are lost in that. Yeah. Although um, Independence Day is still the 11th of November, I think. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, so um, I'm going to ask you one a really easy question now. Or, um, Two, two, well, two, a double sort of question. I mean, what what do you enjoy about doing this type of history? And and, and then what do you find, you, what do you not enjoy? What makes you think you'd rather be, um, you know, a historian of, of, of the border in Monaghan, say, you know, digging deep into sources that are all in the same language or things like that? So what do you what do you what do you not what do you enjoy and what do you not enjoy? Or actually finish on the good note. What do you not enjoy? What do you enjoy? Um what I don't enjoy sometimes is just that you know the sheer level of complexity sort of you know wrecks the head at times. Um trying to keep track of all these different groups. It's it's just so dynamic, I think. Um we have a sense in Ireland that identities are fixed and i think that that's you know relatively true you know by the 19th century i think most people know which side they're on there's very little to play for there in poland it's 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 very very dynamic like i said about say the Missourians or some of these other groups and um, and even polish peasants they're not really convinced nationalists until you know late in the 19th early in the 20th century so um the sheer complexity of it is uh is a bit head-wrecking at times what I really like about it is, I suppose, that it that it uh, it challenged that idea of Irish exceptionalism, because I've always been uncomfortable with that. I've always been uncomfortable with people sort of saying, oh, well, the Irish are known for this or, oh, we in Ireland you know, have this tradition. And I feel that you you can't say that without comparing Ireland with other places. And I think that's the beauty of looking at. Uh, Central Europe, that you realise that Ireland is not uh, in many ways exceptional. Of course, there are peculiarities, but uh, on the whole, uh, there is a lot in common. And and I think that's that's really good because I think it helps us understand 
the position of many of these countries in Europe um, currently. You know, it, it's hard maybe to, to sympathize with, with some uh, Eastern Euro European regimes right now, which seem to us as, as, as quite anti-democratic. And, and we don't have an understanding, I think, of their pain, the pain caused by World War II or communism. I think we don't understand that. But I think we, we can appreciate that idea of uh, a that sense of sort of being occupied or being dominated by a government not of our own choice. And I think it, it, that gives us a great uh, insight into what it's like to be a European. You know, the, the British and the French experience shouldn't define Europe. Um, there's no reason why, you know, the Irish experience or the Central or Eastern European experience can't um, stand in for that, that uh, experience of Europe uh, as a whole. Great. I think that's a great note to end on. And I think I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of interference on the line, so it's just probably as well we're, we're, we're ending. Um, thanks to everyone who attended. Thanks to everyone who posted a question. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that the feedback there is very positive. Um, so thanks to everyone. And thanks also to the Department of Art, Culture, Sport, Tourism. And I think I've forgotten something, but thank you to the department for funding this symposium. And uh, thanks to Roisin for a really brilliant talk. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.